Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Fireside with Peter Adkinson on Gen Con TV. Uh, on this show, we go in search of the untold stories behind your favorite games. And we are still looking for stories behind the Dungeons and Dragons game. And today, uh, in this whole season, uh, the Dungeon Masters Guild has been introducing us to new voices in Dungeons and Dragons. And um, today, our guest is Kat Kruger. Uh, Kat has a lot of credits that she's been working on, uh, but she's uh, she's first of all she has her own company, Steampunk Steampunk Unicorn Studio, uh, and that's a little bit of tongue twister, Kat. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> here she's worked on Hero Quest, Baldur's Gate, uh, Betrayal, Baldur's Gate, the Uncaged Uncaged Anthology, which we've talked about a couple of times on this show, and Eyes Unclouded, and oh, all sorts of stuff. Let's just let's just get into it, Kat. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you here because uh, like you just live up the street here, don't you? Are you a Seattle girl? I am. Uh, yeah. Originally from Canada, though. Oh, uh, <laughs> well, let's explore that further. We love our Canadian friends to the north. Uh, so, yeah. So where did you grow up? I grew up in Toronto uh, and then I moved to Halifax where I lived for a number of years before um, before moving to the West Coast and Seattle eventually, yeah. And uh, now, okay, so did you grow up in a family that played games? We played the standard games, you know, like Monopoly and Life and those sorts of games. Um, we didn't, uh, I actually didn't play Dungeons and Dragons until I became an adult, so. Um, right. But well, we you, did play you a lot. Were raised of... in a gaming culture. I mean, same with me. I mean, when I was a kid, yeah. we played. Uh, fam, our family played games, and yeah, certainly it wasn't Dungeons and Dragons. No, but um, yeah, <laughs> I don't uh -oh. think Dungeons and Dragons have been invented yet. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> D and D was actually invented the year that I was born. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I I will do the math here in front of everybody. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, yeah, like me, you grew up playing kind of family games, and then did that? How did that transition? Um, did you uh, did you did you kind of not worry about games, not care that much about games until years later as an adult? Is that no? Uh, I as a young girl, I used to code my own text adventures, uh, dating myself even further. <laughs> nice. Uh, nice. Yeah, so I used to write uh, write and code my own text adventures, which I, I really loved. And um, I think that translated eventually into this as a career. Um, but before this, I was, um, I was a, a, a writer and journalist and a novelist. So um, there was a lot okay, of so writing in my background, but the, the gaming part, like I've, uh, I think there was like a little bit of a lapse between um, childhood and now, um, but I did do a lot of video gaming and sword and sorcery type of video games have always been, I love oh. those. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So like Baldur's Gate, your recent work on Baldur's Gate might have been mm -hmm. kind of like coming back home, right? In a Absolutely. Way? <laughs> oh, that I was love it. I love so, it. so exciting to be a part of that. Oh, those classic fantasy titles of video mm -hmm. games, you know, uh, younger kids just don't get it. So, <laughs> yeah, they, don't, they, don't, they don't understand it all. Uh, okay, so let's let's back up and, and talk about real life for a second. So you were, where did you go? Like when you went to school, did you go to college and uh, like get a get a proper education somewhere? Is that? I, uh, I went to Mount St. Vincent University in Halifax uh, for my university degree and I got a degree, a Bachelor of Public Relations. Okay. Um, and uh, about a week before I graduated, I got a job at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation as uh, basically a social media um, producer. Okay. Um, so at the time, social media was brand new um, and it was just producing content online uh, for a digital portal called CBC Books. Okay, okay, nice. 
And so, um, uh, how did this all eventually ended up in Seattle? So like, well, yeah, we have to why. jump around. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I've kind of lost track of real life gaming. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> let's get me, help me get to a place of you playing Dungeons and Dragons. Sure. How about that? Yeah, help so, me that space. so, uh, after working as a, an arts journalist, essentially, or social media journalist, uh, for, about five years, I got into publishing. I started writing my own um, young adult books. Um, so I have like a, a, a werewolf YA series. Um, that got me into as a guest as uh, at um, a convention called HalCon in Halifax. Okay. It's the largest uh, convention on the East Coast of Canada. Okay. Um, so people from all around the provinces in the Maritimes go to that convention basically. Um, and as a guest there, uh, I had a, they gave me a personal assistant and this personal assistant happened to also be the personal assistant to, um, my partner, uh, Chris Tulock, who works at, um, Wizards of the Coast. He was there as a program specialist, um, for Dungeons and Dragons. And we got to talking, um, about D and D, uh, and I had never played, I'd read the Dragonlance series voraciously loved those oh, books nice. yes yes um but never got exposed to D, &D as as a kid or a young adult and um his job was to show people how to play D, &D. and this was right before 5e came out okay um and so I learned how to play at a convention um loved it so much that I started a home game and then um, I was working at a at a at risk youth uh, center doing workshops there, and I was teaching creative writing through Dungeons and Dragons. Like that's how much I I, I saw the application for D and D um, and collaborative storytelling. Um, so yeah, I I had one game, and then I started my I guess my life as a DM. <laughs> and down the path of D&D. And eventually um, I was a guest again at HowCon and Chris was a guest again at HowCon the next year. And long story short, I moved across country and uh, across the border uh, to be in Seattle um, with my partner. <laughs> <laughs> it's all very tied together. <laughs> yeah, so that first game you played of Dungeons and Dragons, what was that like? It was incredible. It was because I I had seen obviously D and D is so uh, part of pop culture. I had seen it played in places like Freaks and Geeks and Community, uh, and it always looked so fun. Um, but it was it was what I expected it to be. Um, it was it was just a lot of fun, like being at the table with all these all these people that, you know, not necessarily all of them, uh, I I didn't necessarily know all of them, but it felt like after we were done, we knew each other. <laughs> right. Well, you know, I, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, you know, the, the unique part of it is the the agency, you know, the, the ability to just make a decision, do whatever you want to, not being constrained by a board. I, I was blown away by that uh, at, at some point. I, I didn't get that actually in my first game. I had to um, it took me a while before I really understood the depth of freedom that you have. Did you get that right away or did you, even, did you know that that was coming? Um, I thought there might be more constraints with the rules. And I think maybe that was part of why I was a little um, unsure about like, like starting a game. Um, but it, it didn't feel that way at all. Like the rolling of the dice is just part of it. It's basically like whatever math happens in in a video game, you know? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, like okay, we're gonna have you're gonna have some chance of success, some chance of failure, or some degree of, of mm -hmm. possibilities here. And yeah, there's some math behind it. Just just mm -hmm. go, you know, tell me. Yeah, the, I think yeah, the the agency part that you're talking about, what ca really came in the in the in the role playing and like problem solving which I really enjoyed. Right, right. Yeah, I think um, um, uh, it, I always like to get into that particular, you know, that moment when you, so, so you played the game once and then you decided to start using it as part of your creative writing courses. 
Yes. Um, and, and I started a home game as well, um, not having any real understanding of, like, so true understanding playing, of the rules. <laughs> so you went from playing one game to DMing. Yes. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, I went straight. I, I, yeah, I went straight to DMing. I didn't even get to play once. I went, I, I bought the blue box set. Mm -hmm. This was in 1978. I lived in a boarding school. There was nobody else in the boarding school that knew how to play it. And so, but I, I didn't get the agency part. I just started playing it like a board game and right. um, yeah. it took a while to, to, you know, early, you know, early parts of our grand culture of Dungeons and Dragons here, it took us a while to figure out how to express, this is what you do in a, in a game. And, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. the, in the first, first version of Dungeons and Dragons, they never used the term role-playing. Yeah. They call it a board game. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, so you moved out to Seattle to be with your honey, and um, uh, and then did you start playing then with him or? What? Um. Yes. So we have a weekly game now. Um, right. And it's always been um, a virtual game because we have friends and family across the country that we play with. Um, right. So we have a weekly game. Um, our first big one was going through um, Chris Estrad. Um, nice. And we also had a Wednesday night game. Um, and yeah, so we, we've had up to two, uh, two weekly games um, together since, we've, uh, since I've moved here. Um, I also have, um, another weekly game that I play. So, <laughs> and then I have a podcast. So there are weeks where I, I play like four games Almost. in a week. <laughs> Almost every day. Almost. Kat, this is just like college. I, you know, that's when I was in college. Um, me and a bunch of my friends during our senior year of college decided that all of us would skip um, the um, recruiting meetings or mm -hmm. when the big companies would come to campus. And we said, let's skip that. Let's agree. We're just all going to move to Seattle, and then we'll all stay together and play games. And we just play D and D instead of going recruiting. And nice. yeah, I, 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 I get that. Except for the guy that had the idea, he moved to Colorado. Um, <laughs> anyway. um, okay. So how did? So well, first of all, before we get into the professional part and playing Dungeons and Dragons, so what? What do you like to play? Like, what's your? What What gets you excited about? playing Dungeons and Dragons? What sort of game? What sort of character? You know, I'm kind of all over the place because um, sometimes I really like to play the smashy character uh, because that's what I like from those old like Baldur's Gate video games, right? Just like going in and right. smashing things, right? Like in if I play Diablo, <laughs> I'm in there smashing all the vases, right? Looking right. for treasure. Um, right. So sometimes I like to play that type of character. Generally though, like <clears throat> I frame all of my characters going in as as essentially their chaotic good. So how that manifests itself as a character, um, right. that's that's where the baseline is. Um, so um, I'm in another podcast called uh, I was in another podcast called Adventure They Wrote, and that was my first time playing a cleric. Um, which I really enjoyed as well, but she turned out being very smashy also. I thought she was like, I don't know, yeah. because I don't have the background, uh, you know, that long history of d and I always thought, you know, Cleric was the healer of the party and therefore, you know, probably squishy and oops, I just turned somebody into goo. <laughs> 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 yeah, Clerics and d and have always been a little bit on the tough side, you know, uh, some would argue the best character class in some editions. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, it, it really depends. Uh, you know, sometimes I'll play just a completely ridiculous character um, yeah. and other times very serious. I think um, I do have a, um, a bit of a history um, in, you know, growing up doing theater. So I think that okay. that helps that as well. Like I, I don't necessarily play the one, one character type. I usually try to branch out and, you know, do voices and different I was just about to ask. You break out the funky <laughs> accents and the oh, funky yeah. voices. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> Not every game, but yeah. Um, the Saturday game I'm currently in, I've basically rolled um, 
a character that's very inspired by Rayla from the Dragon Prince. So I have um, sort of an Irish um, accent for that character. Nice. Nice, nice. Um, uh, in directing, I, I I'm the same way, by the way. And in in directing voiceover for my other business, I've been doing a lot of um, I, I I work with a lot of characters in my series that have different accents um, because it's medieval and there were you know not many Americans back then. Yes. And so <laughs> most of the accents are German or Arab or something. And mm -hmm. um, so I work with accents coach, and I'm like I'm riveted while the accent coach is giving the advice to the actor how to do a German accent. Like okay, I'm memorizing this for later. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, for my podcast, D20 Dames. Um, I'm the DM there, and I'm constantly looking at those how to do this type of accent video. Yeah, it's exactly. incredible, like just the, the tiny little bits that that you know uh, can um, can help you. Just yeah, it, even if you're not like going deep into the accent, because you know it's right. it's yeah. a quick role play or or NPC. Right. Like uh, it's still just those little bits of of uh, of information that that are provided to to change your the tonally how you deliver things is really cool well like mouth posture mm -hmm. is huge mm -hmm. just just how you hold your mouth and where you mm -hmm. put your tongue and whether mm -hmm. your air is coming low or up and, and um, the nasal and, yeah exactly yeah and atti attitude attitude is mm -hmm. huge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, i hope you don't mind just just talking about that we're going to get to your projects i promise you but i i, I there was one other thing you said that made me curious you said you all you Always start your characters with chaotic good, which of course brings up the old Dungeons and Dragons question: What does it mean to be chaotic? Yeah, what? what <laughs> want to give us your insight of what chaotic means in Dungeons and Dragons? I really put you on the spot. Yeah, on. no, to, to I know there's like to me it's it's like following following whims, but. Um, but it's it's based on the on the alignment as well. So if you're if you're chaotic good, then you're erring on the side of good. If you're chaotic evil, then you're erring on the side of evil. Um, so to me, it's just like following whims, like not necessarily following um, legalities or rules or right. <laughs> societal uh, right. requirements. <laughs> 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 the okay, rules so, don't apply to me that's basically yes, so, it <laughs> okay i got it i got it i think that's fair i think that's fair hey we have a question for you from chat from the genya i don't know if you that name rings yes. well. uh oh mm -hmm. I, I love it yes ask <clears throat> about her tabaxi <laughs> characters that are all related <laughs> all right so jen is uh she plays right bone zerker on d20 dames uh okay and uh, we actually met uh, through our Wednesday night game, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and my first character there uh, was a tabaxi bard by the name of Dame Ian Nine Lives. Okay. And after we were wrapped <clears throat> with this one um, arc, we um, moved into Tomb of Annihilation. And we were told that we could, you know, roll up other characters if we wanted to or port these ones over. And I decided because um, Dame Ian was very squishy um, that I was going to roll up another character. And in her backstory, I have this whole, um, all the tabaxis that she's related to. And it's, uh, so I, I rolled up uh, Dame Sam Seven Lives, who is a fight an Eldritch Knight fighter. <laughs> I've also got like, oh, I can't even remember all the names, but I haven't played all of them yet, but it's basically nine lives, eight lives, seven lives, you know. Like, oh, got it, yeah. got it, got it. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Jenny, keep the, uh, keep, the, keep the questions coming here. This is your chance to really embarrass Kat. Uh, if you have, oh, we have another question already. It's not from Jenny, it's from uh, Grin and Greg. Uh, with all those games, do you ever find a time to teach slash play test with new players or play with strangers at cons or do you concentrate on building a richer history with your regular groups i do find time to run <laughs> games at conventions <laughs> um i i run uh games at gen con um geek girl con um i i and also i i, I ran some games at um rpg day at our local game shop 
Great. Um, yeah, so I, I do enjoy that part. It's really fun to be able to go out and just play with complete strangers. I've really enjoyed it. <laughs> Yeah. Often, yeah, yeah. often I'll play with with uh, with because because the podcast that I'm on is is family friendly. Often it'll be kids that I um, oh, run yeah. the games for, right. um, right. and I do have a history of you know working with kids. Um, so, I mean, I think oh, that sort of right. adds to the fun too. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic! Yeah, yeah, I love uh, yeah, I love playing with strangers at conventions too. Um, sometimes it's amazing, <laughs> and usually it's good. <laughs> And then there's a few times where like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had that. Uh, but I, I haven't, you know, I don't have like the, the long history of, of doing this either. So <laughs> Oh god, I'll spare you the story about the time one time in Origins where I had to kick somebody out of the game. I just told the guy, gone, gone, yeah. you're out of here. <laughs> All right. On that note, so let's move <laughs> toward um, so how did you get into doing this? professionally like how did you make the jump from oh, i just like to play dnd with my friends oh well i mean right away you started working it with your a creative writing classes so i see that's kind of academia when did you decide to go into more public facing sort of work with dnd um i had an opportunity to work with my partner um he was doing an extra life um like an extra um for the stream um, and um, he asked if I wanted to uh, write an, uh, an adventure. It was, uh, it was when James Wyatt at Wizards uh, started doing the plane shifts. Um, okay. So it's, uh, it's basically taking um, a Magic the Gathering setting and making it a D&D &D, um, &D playable. Um, so... Oh, there's a game, there's a product like that on your list of credits, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ixalan. Yeah. Ixalan, so, right. uh, yeah. So before that Ixalan one, I did uh, an Innistrad one because I loved, I love Innistrad for Magic the Gathering. Um, it's just got everything I like uh, because it's got the werewolf transformation cards um, <clears throat> and just that gothic. You're, you're a magic player too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's fantastic. I mean, you played the two greatest games ever published. It's fantastic. <laughs> no bias. <laughs> None whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, I so say I... that as a gamer. I say that as a gamer <laughs> who's been going back a long time. I speak, that, yeah, this was some credibility yeah. here. <laughs> It, uh, yes, but that's my favorite setting. And so when, when he asked, I was like, I was definitely on board. Um, and um, because I have a writing history uh, with the novels and everything, and he's read them, um, he let me sort of take the lead. And so I wrote an adventure there and um, just going through that experience, it was very different than any other writing I'd done before because it feels very much like it's, there's a very creative element to it, but there's also a very technical aspect. So it's like writing a technical uh, document for having mm -hmm. fun. Right, right, right. You, you mean like stats and stuff? Is that like, yeah. Yeah, the stats and the mechanic, like, you know, how how you uh, think that uh, a social interaction is going to play out and what sort of uh, skill checks you're going to need for that. Right, and, right. you know, the bullet point of like, this is what this character knows and you know what's important in this scene you know um it was it was a really interesting challenge creatively uh but i loved it and after that um i really wanted to get get into it a lot uh more so we have a great question from chat and uh i'm going to get to that uh mm -hmm. please be patient with me a uh, person in chat um i i want to um explore just a little bit while we're on the topic of magic the gathering and <laughs> because you also have a product, you know, glancing really, um, uh, you, you also have a credit uh, in, in, um, uh, in one of the lists you sent me. So what, um, uh, what were some of the challenges of writing for a Dungeons and Dragons? I mean, how do you do, how did you deal with um, like Planeswalkers and Colors of Magic and stuff like that? Or, or did you just like now we're not going to uh, thankfully for the first uh for the first one that i wrote actually both of the ones that i wrote uh james wyatt created a uh document a plane shift document for the setting so it it walked me through 
um, a lot of that. Um, it even gave some game stats. Um, and, and then what I did was I just went through, um, I don't know if they still print them now, but they, they had like a card list book. Um, <coughs> so I could go through the book and just sort of draw cards that were inspiration um, mm. from all the, um, um, the sets um, in Innistrad and, and then just kind of go from there. So the combination of having that documentation from, from James and having um, the card set really um, helped keep things very focused. Hmm. Okay, great. Um, well, let's see. Uh, our question from chat is from kind of over average. Cap, are there any specific considerations you look to for running compassionate RPGs since it's your superpower? Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and please do tell us about this superpower because that sounds pretty awesome. <laughs> um, I think this person is referring to um, uh, the D20 Dance podcast because we tend to um, not go, it's uh, words before swords sort of mentality. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, which is a sharp contrast, I might add, to um, your <laughs> earlier discussions about mm -hmm. going in to blow, to blow things up. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> There are many, many faces of Cat Kruger here. Cat Kruger um, is a multifaceted. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, but in terms of uh, of running compassionate RPGs, I think uh, you know, as we were talking about, you know, running games with strangers. Um, one of the things that I do is um, I sort of remind people about the other rules. Um, so when you go in and um, let's say you're fighting um, a creature, um, one of the things I often, I often say is, you know, you do not have to kill this character. <laughs> um, you know, a, uh, if, if, you, if you hit to zero hit points, you do not have to kill this character. This is your choice. Um, right, right, right. Um, so I give those sorts of options. Um, I also uh, I also use um, uh, voices and ways in for people to maybe see um, monsters as more than monsters. Um, I, I try to uh, give them hints at alternate solutions uh, so that they could take that um, rather than going in slash and hack right, <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's, it's basically just like laying laying down some some groundwork uh before a conflict happens um and sometimes mm -hmm. during the conflict um i might let let it slip that there's this there's this way um, right. right yeah right so uh, I want to talk about your podcast a bit because you've mentioned it a couple of times. And so let's say <laughs> it's very <right>. tied. <laughs> it seems um, integrated into a lot of your philosophy, I, I suppose, and your yeah. thinking. And um, it's called D20. D20 Dames. D20 Dames. Okay. I want you to say it first. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it is, um, uh, so explain what, what is the, I mean, you GM on this. So is it basically an actual play podcast or, I mean, how, how do you uh, tell us more about it? Yeah. Uh, D20 Dames is, uh, it is an actual play. We, we call it a storytelling podcast powered by a D&D. &D. Um, right. It is actual play uh, in the sense that, you know, we, we do roll dice. We, um, you know, that's how it's adjudicated. Uh, I'm the DM. Um, everybody plays uh, their 5e characters. Um, and we go off and have these adventures. Uh, it is a family-friendly podcast, which I think is, um, there's not a lot of us um, around. And it's also all femme, uh, predominantly um, people of color. Uh, podcast and um, yeah, um, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> so what? Uh, how long has it been going? What episode are you on? How, how far are you into this? Oh, 
Um, Round I, numbers. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, I don't even know how many episodes we're in, but we started in uh, November of 2017. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Three years. Yeah. Holy yeah. What level are, are they, is it the same cast, same characters? So. Same, same cast, same characters. Uh, we we just wrapped season three, so we're on a, a, a break uh, right now. And they're when we, it's hard to I can't remember what level we ended up because we just also recorded all of season four um, because sure. one of our cast members is is <clears throat> pregnant and um, expecting uh, in December. So we decided that we were just uh, recording everything uh and give her a break <laughs> right right nice nice uh and so what uh uh um uh -oh. okay oh. okay <laughs> well now i'm frozen again We are having some technical difficulties. We will be uh, momentarily. Uh... <laughs> sure. <laughs> back hopefully here um <laughs> <laughs> oh no <laughs> oh there i am again do you see me am i here yes <laughs> all right I apologize let's uh, uh try so um let's hurry and get into a topic before i cut out <laughs> <laughs> okay uh eyes unclouded uh with uh um, and by the way we've had sadie lowry and jackie leung uh on yes. our show who uh both worked on uh, this project uh so um what did you do on well first of all my, for anybody who missed one of those episodes maybe you can explain a little bit about what eyes unclouded is and um and then transition into what you what your work was on this project. Sure. Uh, so it is an anthology that's inspired by uh, Japanese classic animation, specifically Studio Ghibli. Um, and I got involved uh, as soon as I saw the call for submissions. Um, I might have been one of the first. I, I had an idea right away, so I sent it in within the next, like, within ten minutes of it going up. Um, and uh, my my uh, one shot adventure um, is uh, inspired by um, uh, Princess Mononoke, and um, I decided to do a time loop with that as the inspiration. A, a time loop. Yeah. Um, <laughs> did this uh so what what did you okay now you gotta help me out there's a time loop in dungeons and dragons <laughs> yeah i've wanted to do one for a very long time because i uh i i mean i just love the concept um you know groundhog day is is one of the funniest movies and um you know just the time loop in in the sense of like from storytelling um, and other other media, I really enjoy, and I really wanted to take up the challenge of trying to do it in Dungeons and Dragons. And uh, so my idea was that this uh, village is stuck in a time loop after um, after a conflict about a hundred years ago, um, where it's sort of nature versus civilization, and mm -hmm. a magical well is built over, and how that destroys um, 
the magic around it and time itself is um, it eventually erodes over the course of a hundred years. And you know, when the adventuring party lands in this uh, in the city, they've got essentially three time loops, uh, three three rotations of the time loop to to solve this this hundred year old mystery. <laughs> oh, wow. So is it kind of, do, so do you play it kind of like Groundhog Day? I mean, not to trivialize it, but like basically, okay, something, nah, you didn't quite make it. So then you, you start over, but you can kind of skip over the parts. Like I imagine yeah. as a player, I want to write down kind of all what I thought all the key moments were. And then oh, let's go back and change moment number three. And let's yeah. start killing the bartender. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 sort of like a montage the the next two days, right? Um, right. And I did take uh, uh, some inspiration as well from uh, I think it's Will Doyle who wrote uh, the Pudding Fair, and that's also a time loop one. Okay, um, okay. I'm not familiar uh, with that, but uh, I trust you. Oh, yeah. Very cool. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, it strikes me as it would give you the freedom uh, as a writer or as a GM to be just really, really tough, right? I mean, like you, you, you screw up, okay, that's okay. You could, you could come back and try it again, right? Yeah, absolutely, so, yeah. Because you you can like- uh, TPK the party and- Exactly, and then yeah, yeah. resets. <laughs> <laughs> right, like, like it's kind of like playing a video game that way, right? I mean, like you go in, fight the boss and you get your ass kicked and, and yeah. like, okay. Here's respawn, your save points. <laughs> yes, that's right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you uh, also worked on um, uh, Uncaged. Now this this looks like a fantastic uh, book. Uncaged, um, uh, sort of female mo female gender monsters of mythology or fiction, sort of re envisioned. And let's look at this again, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a retelling of some classic monsters who may have been maligned in history <laughs> or in the telling of their stories. Um, it's, you know, they're not necessarily um, retold uh, in a sense that they're, they're no longer villains or monsters or whatever, but um, it is retold from a different perspective. Um, and mine was... Um, was inspired by a Korean folklore um, uh, about the nine-tailed fox. Okay. And um, it was specifically inspired um, when I heard um, a story on a podcast podcast called Myths and Legends, um, which I'm constantly going through to just get ideas from. So if anybody is out there looking for mythology to to draw from, I highly recommend this podcast. It's it's really great. It's I he just goes through mythologies of the world, um, retells them from a modern perspective. And the Fox sister, uh, oh, it's one of the early ones and it really stuck with me um, because it was so scary. Can, um, can you, uh, you know, uh, for us readers who aren't familiar with this um, story, can you tell yeah. us the original story and then kind of what yeah. your take was on it? So the original story uh, from the Myths and Legend, um, like, it is a it is a classic story, uh, but it was just retold. Um, so it's essentially uh, there are these three brothers living on a farm, uh, a ranch, and uh, their father um, wishes more than anything to have a daughter. Um, he gets his wish, and then it the little girl. Um, you know, one day wanders off into the forest, and when she comes back, she's a little bit different. And then at, from that point forward, cows start getting disappearing or being um, butchered. Um, and, then, uh, and then eventually the family does. And one of the brothers manages to escape. And he has like these three potions and he you know, throws them at, the, at his little sister and manages to escape, um, you know, the end, right? Um, right. But from my perspective, um, because the story is essentially the girl brought a curse upon the family. It's a curse right. to have a, a girl in the family. I, I, I thought, hmm, let's retell this. Um, so in my versions, spoilers, um, it's actually the, the mother who's the nine-tailed fox uh, protecting the little girl from 
the brothers who want her dowry. Mm. Um, so the adventuring party comes in after all this history has happened right. um, and the farm is abandoned, long abandoned. Uh, and they go in and discover the little girl. Um, it's sort of like a red herring where the little girl might be the, might be the, the right. nine fox. Um, and um, yeah, it's a little bit, it's a little bit spooky, um, but I really enjoyed retelling that story. Nice, nice. Um, well, we have a question from chat, also from kind of over average, mm -hmm. is any advice for creating inclusive adventures by design? Um, I think if you're writing from outside uh, an experience, uh, definitely you know, do your research. Um, so, you know, taking Miss and Legends as, as an example, he does a lot of research. Um, and I know that he's had some sensitivity um, advisors uh, for certain stories. Um, I think I think when you just look at your list of NPCs and your setting uh, to start off with, like go from there and then build from there. Um, you know, look very um, directly at you know if you're if you're if all of your NPCs are male then or male presenting then is there a reason why they are that way? Is there an opportunity for you to expand? um this world um and this view i think you know by design just you know look at all the all the things that you do by rote and it gives you an opportunity to to rethink things and sometimes in rethinking things it uh generates uh more creativity and more great creative um answers or worlds or npcs that you might be inspired by yeah, you know, it's um, I, I've had to struggle with this because I'm publishing a story called Chaldea and my other business, and um, uh, and for and and I, I can tell you one thing that doesn't quite work <laughs> or doesn't do the whole job is to just is just we 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 tried to just uh, the um, we wanted to be inclusive, but we limited our thinking to the lead characters. In other words, we did this really good job of creating this cast of lead characters that was balanced ethnically and gender um but um uh then we found out that we were just falling into our typical uh sort of white guy uh, patterns of who all the npc you know all not, I, I should say npcs because it's not a game yeah but some, uh, uh who all the supporting characters supporting were, characters, the recurring yeah. characters and the bad guys mm -hmm. and stuff like that and um uh, and we were mainly thinking along gender and ethnicity and didn't think as much as we should have along um, uh, sexual um, orientations and um, uh, other uh, or ableist sort of things. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to, um, uh, it, it takes a constant committed effort to overcome all of the things that are, are natural um leanings you know yeah and and yeah and i think that you know just just looking from from the baseline of every single thing that you you know put in there like the ask your ask yourself why i think mm -hmm. that that's a yeah. good starting point anyway <laughs> yeah it's uh it's something that takes real dedication to um to to do it well and um uh yeah um okay well let's let's go on to um un breakable yes. <laughs> so this one uh it is uh well jackie was on um yes. talking about this one as well uh and this one is um all asian creator and illustrators uh telling asian inspired uh, adventures um in an anthology um which one i just gotta jump in i think that, that grabbed me right off the bat you know you know asian stories told by asians i mean that that effectively uh was the the the, the premise of the you know the, the through line of it and i thought well now that's that's a good it's a good idea yeah um yeah it was really great working on this project too and again i was inspired by Miss and legends um and uh for for this one i retold the story of um 
It's a Nepalese story called The Old Nanny Goat. Um, and essentially it's, it's sort of like a Cinderella story where, you know, evil stepmother, um, mistreats the daughter, the stepdaughter, um, and she, um, she befriends an, an old nanny goat who sustains her through, you know, really horrible conditions. Um, but in the original story, it's essentially the goat, like, vomits up nutritional matter for the child, um, consumes it. And then the stepmother finds out about the goat um, and kills it and tries to feed it to the girl. Um, mm. And then the girl is just so distraught. Um, at the end of the night, after the meal is cleaned up, she takes the bones, buries it in the garden and a tree springs up from it. And it, it springs up and um, um, grows uh, dumplings. So <laughs> yeah, so she can feed off of this dumpling tree um, because it was the bones of this nanny goat that was looking after her. Um, and eventually there's um, an elderly couple that comes along, asks, asks for some, uh, some of the dumplings and she, she gives them to them and they, they try to, um, they basically say, oh, you're, you're, you're in this terrible condition, come, come, you know, we'll, we'll take care of you. So she goes with them and they turn out to be um, lockies, which are these uh, red faced black haired demons um, mm -hmm. and they're uh, carnivorous cannibalistic demons. And um, thankfully she, <clears throat> uh, she's able to, you know, speak with uh, a mouse attempts to um, communicate with her to, to warn her that, you know, there are demons here and she's like feeding the mouse, being very kind to the mouse. Right. Um, and that's why the mouse is, uh, speaks with her. Um, and she's able to escape. And then when she escapes, um, she escapes with some treasure because the mouse had told her about it. And uh, when she comes back home, the stepmother sends her actual daughter um, to go back to steal from these demons because she thought that the girl was lying. Um, and uh, that girl, um, because of how she, she grew up, uh, she did not listen to the mouse um, and didn't, didn't make, make it. it. Yeah, so my story is called The Lost Children and our adventure is called The Lost Children. And uh, it's essentially after like decades after um, this young girl is now um, an old woman and a child has gone missing from the village. And essentially it's, these demons have returned. Oh, wow. Okay. Now I, I just have a quick question about the demons. You call them cannibalistic demons. I mean, that those are demons that eat other demons? Uh, yeah, no, they're not. Car <laughs> uh, yeah, they're car carnivorous demons. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, oh, you're a human no. girl. I thought the story was going, oh, yeah, you're a no. human girl. Fine. Sorry. We only eat other yeah. demons. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Sorry, my mind goes strange places. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so um, so that's uh, Unbreakable. Unbreakable is all, like Uncaged is an anthology of adventures, right? That yes. um, uh, that you can get on Drive Through RPG, right? On the Dungeon Masters Guild uh, website of, of Drive Through. Rec so recommend, yes, uh, go check it out, and um, uh, you can get these. There's adventures. some very very cool adventures in there, yeah. Ready? Hey, um, we have another question from chat with compassion and inclusion in mind can you describe your prep process for convention games well she said okay con games that could mean convention games i'm gonna let's assume that assume that yeah um <laughs> I, yeah uh, i think it's it's going back to like giving those opportunities to you to the players even though you don't necessarily know everyone there um it's um giving like humane human qualities to the um the monsters that you're presenting um i do like running adventures that are, are not necessarily fully um you have to fight the big bad and and like destroy them like there are other solutions and it's um sort of like bird seeding um some of these little bits of information that might give you some backstory on on the big bad or you know um maybe there's a minion that you talk to that um has some information to give um and 
yeah, I, I think part of it is actually running running adventures that um, aren't one hundred percent. You have to hack and slash your way through it. I do, I do still. You know, I'm not gonna. You know harsh on anyone's fun if they want to you know if they want to smash the the big bad at the end that's that's totally fine too like um but you know i i do tend to lean towards the the role play or other um uh other ways right. of, of uh you know it's, so it's okay to occasionally have like okay this is a vampire and it's not the romantic kind this vampire just really really loves blood and will, yes will suck oh, yeah. it however yeah however absolutely he or she can right yeah yeah i mean like yeah, like yeah. you know the the um <laughs> those lockies at in the last adventure i was talking about like oh yeah there's, there's no there's making friends with those no <laughs> Yeah. yeah, demons are demons. That's okay. <laughs> the demons are de you know, it's like, why are the demons evil? Uh, yeah, because they're powered by the abyss and it's like, like chaotic evil. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're also random, but they tend to be random more in the bad way than the good way. Bring us back to one of our earlier conversations. Yes. <laughs> oh <laughs> uh, okay so um i i was you also had a, a credit that sound like a board gaming related credit uh ball like um uh it was betrayal at Baldur's gate is that betrayal right at Baldur's gate and also hero quest is the most i, I, I have a cheat on. sheet list but like because <laughs> of my technical problems i'm scared to even switch windows at this point oh, so gosh. i'm just like i'm going by memory <laughs> <laughs> that's great <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I wrote uh, some haunts for Betrayal at Baldur's Gate, um, which is, um, well, uh, Betrayal at House on the Hill is the original board game, yeah. and then um, the Baldur's Gate version came out, you know, several years later, so I got to, got to write ha haunts for that, and I also recently just wrapped up uh, work on Hero Quest, which is also um, a board, board game from the late 80s. That, yeah, uh, oh, oh, yeah. Yes, Heroes <laughs> Quest. Yeah, that's that's from way back. Yeah. yeah. But you had a note, I think you said you couldn't really talk about it, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Why can you, you can't tell me anything about it at all. Mm -hmm. I can oh. I can tell you about the game, <laughs> but you you already know about the game. Uh, okay, but I, you know, for anybody uh, who doesn't know what the game is, it's uh it's essentially I feel like it was like a a, a stepping stone for a lot of people to get into uh, RPGs um, because right. it's sure. it's a board game yeah. version of like a D&D &D, um, yeah. classic um, adventuring party um, yeah. and you work through all these uh, all these quests so quest by quest um, to right. go through uh, dungeons or whatever and uh, defeat defeat the evil creatures in there and and yeah and, and I would say in the old version wasn't very good at sort of talking your way through the encounters. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very, very much yeah. a tactical. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this, this, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm interested in seeing how you solve that problem, Kat. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. I won't press any more on that one. Uh, <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> okay. So uh, let's go back. Let's go back to Betrayal Baldur's Gate then. Uh, so what was it like to write a haunt? I mean, how similar was that to writing a, an RPG uh, encounter? Um, it's similar in the way that uh, you're telling a story, except it is way more condensed. Um, yeah, it, it, you have to be very, very concise. And I feel like that's where my public relations writing really <laughs> helps sometimes. Um, Grid yeah, your you, key messages, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, it, it, you have like a very short amount of uh, word count to, uh, to tell this story. Um, and the one that, um, that I, I wrote was, um, was based on the Gosias tree. Um, so it's, um, the trees kind of overtake the vine blights and stuff kind of overtake the board and you have to fight your way to the Galsias tree um, to destroy this evil that's uh, kind of trying to grow through the streets of Baldur's Gate. Wow, excellent, excellent. 
Um, I is there anything else you want to say before I ask you our closing? Oh, wait, hey, we have a question from chat. So I take that back. Um, any specific things from chat, also from kind of over average. Any specific things you look for early in a group of strangers? Huh. From a oh, from running the game. At I guess a for running a convention, look for um hmm, that's an interesting. interesting. Question. I uh, who's, who brought snacks? That's tenly what yeah. I, I look for. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Uh, like the the conventions that I played at is it's basically they're they're open like people sign up for the table. So I don't really have a. I don't think we generally have a say in who's at the table. Um, yeah. I think if you're, uh, I don't know if this. I'm gonna I'm gonna make some assumptions here and and say that maybe you might be looking for um, how do you set up the tone at your table. Um, I think that well, I'll ask that. Well, yeah, let's go with that. Yeah, uh, I think you know part of it is introducing who who I am and the things that I do. So you know when I feel like when when I lead with I'm part of a family friendly podcast um, that is very clear you know, what the table should generally right. look like um, right. uh, in terms of, of play. Um, I mean, like at the same time, you know, like I've, I've run games like the Rat Queens. Um, um, so it's, you know, they're kind of brutal fighters um, and not family friendly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> however, like, I think, I think there's, there's still a line, right? Um, right. Oh, here we go. Uh, to clarify how to read what they want from a game and how to adjust. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, uh, I think for that part, I, what I do is I, I ask them to describe themselves and their characters um, from the start. Um, because if, if they're describing um, a character who really enjoys, you know, smashing vases, then I'll put a vase out there for them. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah it's uh it's it's that's interesting i think that's i think that's your advice i think it's a really good one if you ask the players to describe their character you can you can you get some clues from what how they describe their character as to what they uh are might be interested in yeah yeah just uh yeah my yeah my advice is definitely just uh ask ask what they're what they're playing and and you know draw it out a little bit so that you have a little bit more information to go on Right, right. All right. Well, I am going to ask you uh, our our final question. Thank you, by the way, uh, to kind of over average for uh, several questions from chat. That's always yes, a pleasure when we get some interaction from uh, from the channel. So, um, uh, all right. So, my final question for you, Cat, is um, uh, Dungeons and Dragons is uh, as we, which we agree is um, this amazing game. It's been around for a long time since the seventies. And there's a lot of people that have worked on it. So what do you hope to bring to Dungeons and Dragons? It's like what what what's your goal? What's it what's your legacy that you're shooting for? I hope that my legacy is that um I do I do bring a different perspective. Um and that um, you know, I'm able to bring uh stories from cultures that um you might not necessarily have heard. So um, and sort of highlighting those, but also very, very strongly hope that, you know, and I think some people in chat have been very kind about this, um, that I do, uh, I am able to bring like compassionate storytelling to the table um, and show ways of, um, of role playing and problem solving um, using this system, um, you know, in a non combative way. Um, I think it is there. I think <clears throat> I think there's some conversation about it not being a, a great system for that, but I I heartily disagree um, because I have three years of a podcast that says otherwise. <laughs> well, it's great. I mean, if uh, if it works for you, then that's fabulous. I mean, it's a wonderful thing about D and D is you so flexible. You can play it in so many. Yeah, ways. and uh, you know, absolutely. The you know the cast on D twenty Dames. You know, we there are creatures that they have to fight, um, but it's not necessarily the first thing that we do. Like there's right. there's so much uh, story available um, 
through using um, D and D um, that isn't combat related. Um, even downtime, you know, we we've, we've had so much fun recording downtimes, um, just hanging out and developing your character, um, developing sure. relationships. Um, it's yeah. So I'm I'm hoping yeah. that those that's all part of my legacy. <laughs> Well, that's great. I, you know, I think that you will succeed marvelously. Mm, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. So, uh, thank you so much for coming into a, coming onto my show. Um, well, that wraps Thanks up another episode me. of Fireside with Peter Adkison here on Gen Con TV. Uh, uh, I hope you come back next week. Uh, I'm, I'm not talking to you now. Kat. Well, Cat, you can come back and watch next week. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just to be clear um because <laughs> i have another amazing guest coming in laura hersbrunner will be my guest on fireside uh next week um uh, but that's a whole week away so in the meantime we have lots of other great programming here on gen con tv for you to uh, come watch um on friday at 2 p.m is table takes join bonsai and emic and derek and isabella von ghoul for our week weekend review our tabletop news show um, on Monday at 6 p.m., uh, we have board games with the Brothers Murph. On Wednesdays at 1.30 Pacific, we have board games with This Game Gets Dicey. And then at 4 p.m. Pacific, back to Fireside with me. Uh, if you miss any of our shows, you can find our streams about a day or so later on Gen Con Video on YouTube channel, uh, including all the episodes we've filmed uh, so far for Fireside, where I've uh, gone in search of untold stories behind Dungeons & Dragons and Magic the Gathering. Um, also, if you want to connect with other Gen Con people, please join our community on our official Gen Con Discord server. Uh, so please remember to follow, to subscribe, turn on your notifications, tell your friends. And thanks again to our guest, Kat Kruger. Thanks to our studio manager, Marcus Mays, our producer, Derek Guder, to Dungeon Masters Guild for introducing us to the new voices in Dungeons and Dragons, uh, to Gen Con TV for hosting us. And most of all, thank you for watching.